This lecture is brought to you by the virtual campus of the Reformed Baptist Seminary. For information on other courses or seminary programs, please contact us at info at rbseminary.org or go to our website, rbseminary.org. All right, so we come to our next lecture. We're going to try to pick up where we left off. We, uh, you know, focused on the creative account in chapter 1 of Genesis where God's establishing His uh, temple palace, as it were. His royal residence, he's setting up his priestly viceroy. We come now to consider God's creation covenant, um, which is alluded to in chapter 1 of Genesis, verses 26 through 30, but most of it is elaborated on in Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 25. So as we consider this section, you know, try to remind yourself that this is depicting the world before Adam's fall into sin. It's unmarred by evil. God pronounces it at the end of chapter 1 very good. And so in that respect, um, the present world you and I live in radically differs from the original state of affairs. But in other ways, the pre- and post-fall worlds share much in common. And one point of alleged continuity is the idea that God always interacts with humanity in terms of a covenant. As one scholar notes, the names given to the two parts of the Bible in Christian tradition, the Old Testament, which could be translated the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, um, these rest on the religious conception that the relationship between God and man is established by a covenant. So this conception led biblical scholars as early as Augustine to speak of God's relationship to Adam as a covenant. The implications of this idea were really not explored until the Protestant Reformation, and from that point on, theologians have commonly described God's original relationship to Adam in terms of covenant of works, covenant of nature, covenant of life, covenant of creation, or covenant with Adam. So if you look in the theology books, they've got the different designators, but none of these really come from directly from the language of Scripture. These are just attempts to sort of describe that relationship. Now, others have offered objections to viewing Adam's relationship to God as covenantal. The pre-fall relationship between God and Adam is never designated such. It's not actually called a covenant. All the basic elements of covenant making are not found in the Genesis creation accounts, chapter 1 or 2. And then they argue that covenants always occur in a context of sin and therefore always signify a redemptive relationship. The idea is that, you know, covenants came into existence because of sin. Were there no sin, you would not need any kind of a covenant. In response, we could point out that the absence of a term doesn't necessarily entail the absence of a concept. We've already seen that the idea, kingdom of God is present in chapter 1, and as we're going to argue in chapter 2. There are some elements of covenant-making in the text. Those missing elements could be assumed. All right, so, you know, sometimes when a biblical writer is describing something or some institution, he may not feel the need to mention all of the details. He could just focus on some of those details. And then, of course, later on we're told that marriage is a covenant, and it turns out that marriage predates the fall. Okay, so there you have a covenant before sin entered into the world. Now, these responses are helpful, but I think we need to you know, do a little bit more digging to see if there's any solid evidence for affirming a creation covenant. And that raises the question, what biblical warrant or justification do we have? So I want to begin and unfold this part of our study by looking at the essence of a covenant. The Hebrew word berit, at its most basic level, refers to a formal commitment or obligation that is self-imposed or imposed upon another party or parties. When the formalized commitment is imposed on another party, 
it assumes the form of covenant stipulation, that is, laws or commandments. Okay, so if, if I you know, write up a covenant and it has these um, impositions, stipulations I'm imposing upon the other party, well, then they, they're, they're like commandments, they're laws. When the formalized commitment is self-imposed, when I say, I commit myself to doing this or doing that, then it takes the form of covenant sanctions, that is, promises or threats. These are often solemnized by an oath, sometimes also by gestures and or signs, like when Abraham tells his servant, put your hand on my thigh and swear. Okay, that was part of the formalization ceremony of that covenant. Now, the Bible contains examples of both parity and non-parity covenants. Some human covenants are made among parties that are more or less equals. And I've given you some passages there to look up. On the other hand, there are examples of human covenants involving a superior and an inferior. In such cases, the superior usually imposes the terms of the covenant upon the inferior, though in some cases, the inferior may request terms. Okay? So, uh, I wrote out our, our marriage vows, but I let my wife request some terms, right? Not really. Not re- I mean, we actually wrote them together. Uh, and, and we took them from the, the Bible, so in a sense, God's the one who gave us the terms, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously God is the superior in the Genesis account, so he's the one who's going to set the terms of the relationship to man and man's relationship to him. So he commissions the man to serve as his vice regent, to rule over the earth, to subdue it to his own glory. He places two symbolic trees in the middle of the garden sanctuary. Remember I said that You know, there can be symbolic gestures, there can be tokens, there can be wedding rings, for example, okay, that remind us of our covenant relationship. Well, God puts two trees to remind Adam that he's in covenant relationship with God. The first is the tree of knowledge, and that reminds man that he's to carry out the task God has assigned to him in God's way, all right? The second, the tree of life, reminds Adam that there's a reward for loyalty and obedience. And so we have formal commitments, obligations, and we have sanctions, curses, and blessings. These are the essential components of a covenant. So that's the essence of a covenant, and I think we see that there in the creation account. But what about echoes of a creation covenant? And this is where the evidence is going to get a little bit more explicit, I think. A careful study of the explicit references to divine human covenants in the Old Testament reveals certain characteristics, themes, that actually echo an earlier covenantal arrangement. And this is really fascinating uh, if you study this out. So, for example, take God's covenant with Noah. The first instance of Berit in your Bible, your Hebrew Bible, uh, is in Genesis 6.18, where God says to Noah, I will establish my covenant with you. Now, what's fascinating about that first reference of covenant is that the Hebrew term translated establish, which is the Hebrew verb kum, refers not to the inauguration of the covenant, That would be the Hebrew word karat, which means to cut. You've probably heard that before, that, you know, in the Bible, God cuts covenants with his people. That's where you inaugurate, you basically initiate a brand new covenant. But that's not the term used here. It's the term that refers to the fulfillment of a prior commitment. For example, in Leviticus 26, verses 3 and 9, God says, If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, I will confirm my covenant with you. There's already a covenant. He's not going to make a covenant. There's a covenant that already exists that he's just going to establish or confirm with them. The implication is that God's words to Noah assume a covenant previously instituted by God. 
So in essence, God is saying to Noah, I will fulfill my prior covenantal commitment that I made all the way back there with Adam. I'm going to fulfill that with you. And so if you compare uh, the prior and subsequent context of Genesis 6, um, I think it suggests strongly that what's in view is God's original mandate to humanity in the creation account. Okay, look at that. What does he do with the first Adam, the first beginning? He commands Adam to be fruitful and multiply. He gives Adam dominion over the earth, provides him with food, prohibits him from eating what is forbidden. And then he says, uh, I'm going to give you the blessing of life and a stable, well-ordered creation. Then when you shift to Noah, which is the new beginning, he commands Noah to be fruitful and multiply. That sounds like the same thing. He gives Noah dominion over the earth. He provides Noah with food, but he prohibits him from eating what is forbidden. He reaffirms to Noah the blessing of life and a stable, well-ordered creation. All right? So it's almost like God is saying, let's start over again. All right? So that very much suggests to me a covenant relationship with the first Adam. We also see echoes of a creation covenant in God's covenant with Abraham and Abraham's seed, which would be the nation of Israel. God promises the patriarchs and their seed an innumerable and royal offspring. He's going to make them fruitful, multiply. A territory over which they'll exercise dominion. Ultimate triumph over their enemies. And the privilege to serve as his royal priesthood. All right, so Abraham and his descendants are going to become something of another Adam. In fact, Israel becomes God's, quote, firstborn son. That's what Adam was called. And Israel becomes the heir apparent whom God destines to inherit a dominion and dynasty analogous to that which God intended for the primeval firstborn son, Adam. So there are parallels there. We also see echoes of a creation covenant in God's covenant with David and with David's sons. So through the leadership of Joshua, Israel successfully takes dominion of the land, subdues its inhabitants, subsequently renewing her covenant with Yahweh at Shechem. And yet, because of unfaithfulness to the covenant, Israel's grip on the promised land is repeatedly in jeopardy. That's the story of Judges. Until God finally raises up for them David, a king after his own heart. Once David reestablishes Israel's control of the land and brings the Ark of the Covenant to its resting place in Jerusalem, there's a reintroduction of the Sabbath theme, God offers David as a royal grant. By the way, we talked about suzerain vassal treaties in the Old Testament and how Deuteronomy resembles a suzerain vassal treaty. Guess what the covenant with David resembles? In the ancient Near East, they had these royal grants in which the suzerain would give a vassal an award, a reward for loyalty rendered. And that reward would be, from now on, you and your descendants shall stay on the throne and you'll have an everlasting dynasty. All right? That's exactly what God's saying here to David in 2 Samuel 7, 8 through 16, an enduring dynasty, these covenant blessings not only advance the earlier promises given to Abraham and his seed, but they also resemble the primordial blessings God intended for Adam. And this appears to be David's own interpretation on the matter. In 2 Samuel 7, 19, he reflexively responds to God's generous gift by exclaiming, Ve'ot Torah ha'adam Adonai Yahweh, which being interpreted, and this is the charter of humanity, or of the Adam, or of the man, O Lord God. It's almost as if David is saying, whoa, I see the connection. I am in some way fulfilling that promise made all the way back in the garden where God says he's going to restore what was lost. 
And so God's covenants with Noah, Abraham and Israel, and David appear to have as their chief aim the advancement of divinely revealed objectives that reach all the way back to man's beginnings. The reverberation of such objectives suggests a creation covenant. Now let's look for elements of a creation covenant right in the Genesis to account. Okay, so our survey of the creation account in Genesis 1 through 2 3 revealed that the opening narrative is all about the kingdom of God, even though the terms king and kingdom never appear. We also found evidence that, uh, that man's identity as God's image relates not merely to his nature as a rational, moral, and religious creature, but also to his unique function as God's priestly viceroy. How does this theme relate to covenant? Well, again, remember the biblical berit, the covenant, is, quote, the instrument constituting the rule or kingdom of God. This idea of covenant is implicit in God's royal mandate to humanity and becomes more explicit as Moses transitions from the first to the second creation narrative with the introduction of God's special covenant name. And so from chapter 2, verse 4, all of a sudden, Moses begins to speak of God not simply as Elohim, but now he joins it with Yahweh. Okay, so it's now Yahweh Elohim, or translated in our English Bibles, the Lord God. I think it's very likely Moses wants his Israelite reader to understand that God's relationship to mankind is covenantal from the very beginning. As, as God begins to meet with Adam in the garden and, you know, tell Adam what he's supposed to do and set some boundaries on their relationship, it's Yahweh, Elohim, because he's making covenant with Man. Another thing to note is that the reference in 2.7 to God's forming man of the dust of the ground, just like the reference to man being the image of God, has royal connotations. The picture of being, quote, raised from the dust was used in the ancient Near East as a metaphor for the conferral of royal status. All right, so God says to Jehu, whom he's going to make whom he made king over northern Israel, he says this, I raised you out of the dust and made you a leader over my people Israel. All right, so again, the writer's not just trying to be poetic, and he's not just trying to be merely descriptive in the sense that maybe there was a theophany in which God literally formed man out of the dust of the earth, but he's using a metaphor that, that's, that speaks of royalty. We've already seen this in some of our earlier lectures, but the Garden of Eden is a royal sanctuary where man's to pay homage to his divine king. And so man's role in Eden's garden has both royal and religious character. Adam's to be a royal priest who advances the kingdom centrifugally over the entire earth. That is to say, the the garden is to expand and expand and expand until the garden covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. All right, you guys have seen in history books the development of an empire. All right, you can look at the Persian Empire when it was small, and then as it keeps growing and growing and growing, or or maybe Alexander, where he's you know trying to conquer the whole earth. That's what Adam was supposed to do. All right, it all started there in the Garden of Eden, but it was supposed to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as Adam was fruitful and multiplied, and there were multiple images of God carrying out the great creation mandate to the ends of the earth. Once they completed their task, they, like their creator, will enter into their own Sabbath rest enthronement. However, to enjoy the blessing of royal eschatological grant, the heir apparent must carry out his imperial commission in a way that accurately reflects the Holy Suzerain's character and that visibly manifests absolute submission and dependence on Yahweh Elohim's revealed will. And so, to prove man's fealty and promote his ethical maturation, Yahweh Elohim devises a probationary test. He places two sacramental trees in the middle of the garden, 
the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He forbids man to eat from the tree of knowledge upon the pain of death. Now, the knowledge of good and evil essentially refers to the ability to make wise decisions. Um, It's often associated in the Bible with kingly virtue and prerogative. And so, we could properly view the two trees as the tree of life and the tree of wisdom. All right? Uh, Maybe you never thought of it that way. But that's what knowing good and evil is about. It's about ethical maturation. For example, King Solomon, remember, was notable for his judicial wisdom. And when he's appointed king, he prays to the Lord, Give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may what? That I may discern, that I may have the knowledge of good and evil. God answers his prayer. Behold, I've done according to your word. See, I've given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before, nor anyone like you shall arise after. Do you realize that at a typological level, the very height of Israel's kingdom is epitomized in Solomon, this man who was the wisest man in the earth, and whose wisdom was predicated upon the fear of Yahweh. That points to where that points to the very goal that Adam himself was supposed to attain. Ethical maturation in the right direction, right? Godliness, the fear of Yahweh, wisdom. That's what God wanted for Adam, and that's what that tree symbolized. And so, knowing good and evil, the ability to exercise wise judgment, and it's a necessary quality to exercise kingly rule. Now, if that's the case, that constrains an interesting twist on God's prohibition. On on the one hand, it appears God doesn't want man to have this knowledge, but on the other hand, it would seem that such knowledge would be necessary if Adam's to exercise effectively his role as God's priestly and kingly viceroy. All right, so that seems interesting, right? Because here's this, this tree that's supposed to represent something Adam needs, and is to cultivate, and is to grow in, and yet God says you can't eat from this tree. So, what does that have to do with? Well, remember, when Jesus was tempted, what did the devil say he was going to offer Jesus? The kingdoms of this world. Was that something good? Yeah. All right. In fact, God said in Psalm 2, uh, You know, I'm going to give you the heathen, the nations as your inheritance. All right? But no, Jesus has to obtain what the Father has destined for him on God's terms and in God's timing, not Satan's terms or timing. And timing is very important. We know this as parents. You know, can I have the keys to your car, mom and dad? You're not ready to drive yet. Okay, that day's coming, but you're not ready to do that yet. There's many things in life you have to wait for. Well, similarly, it was God's will for the first Adam to grow in wisdom and in the ability to exercise that kingly prerogative. But Adam must obtain that blessing on God's terms and in God's timing. In the words of uh, Henri Blocher, it's a French guy, Relative to God, he says, mankind must, in order to be happy, constantly approve his dependence as a vassal and renounce all conspiracy against his suzerain. Relative to God, mankind must rejoice in his filial dependence and reject the mirage of a truant autonomy like that of the prodigal son. So understood in this way, the narrative presents the stipulations and sanctions of a covenant. You have faith and obedience that result in life, unbelief and disobedience that result in death. The Israelite reader could hardly miss the connection in Genesis 2 with the alternatives Yahweh was presenting him in Deuteronomy 30, verses 9 through 20. By the way, Genesis may not have been completely published and made available 
until sometime during or after Moses completed the book of Deuteronomy. All right? So again, keep that in mind, that, 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 that God wanted the Israelites to, to, to understand Genesis in light of their relationship to him in Deuteronomy as they're preparing to enter into the land. And so look at what God says to them. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. That's precisely what he said before Adam. So God is, in effect, saying to the Israelites, I'm kind of restoring that original creation relationship. And therefore, he says, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days. That's covenantal language. And it didn't start in Deuteronomy. And so by way of summary, the use of God's covenant name, Adam created to fulfill a royal function, Adam placed in God's royal and cultic garden, the prospect of attaining royal wisdom by means of loyalty to God and obedience to his stipulations, which loyalty and obedience would be rewarded. All of these elements suggest the presence of a creation covenant. And if that were not enough, all right, just a little extra evidence on the side. Um, the prophet Hosea, in chapter 6, verse 7, brings his fellow Israelites before the bar of God because he says, like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. So there you have another passage. Now, I know some, some verses, or some, some commentators debate there was a town called Adam, and so maybe he's saying, like the people who lived in Adam, the, his contemporaries were transgressing the covenant. I don't think that's likely. I think it's referring to the first Adam. And the fact that Hosea refers to Israel's sin as a breach of covenant and compares them with Adam serves as a commentary on Adam's original relationship with God. Isaiah then universalizes Hosea's verdict of covenant breach. He applies it not just to Israel, but to all the nations. He says, The earth is polluted because of its inhabitants who have transgressed laws, violated statutes, broken, notice this, the ancient Covenant. Now, I know in your version, the ESV, I think it, it may translate it something like the everlasting covenant. All right? But, but that word olam sometimes referred to that which is ancient, that which is primordial. All right? And I think that's, what's, that's what it's referring to, right? Because look, the Gentile nations whom he's referring to in that context, they weren't guilty of breaking the Mosaic covenant. That wasn't made with them or the Davidic, or the Abrahamic. Okay, maybe it could have been referring to the Noahic covenant, but I think it's going all the way back further. They were breaking that original covenant that God made with the first man. What's the practical relevance of a creation covenant? We can view all humans as standing under the creation covenant and therefore as covenant breakers. All right, so look, it's not just that humans are guilty of breaking one of the Ten Commandments. All those people out there are covenant breakers. They are failing to fill and subdue the earth for the glory of God. They may be filling it and subduing it for their own glory, but they're not doing it for God's glory. Secondly, we should view human sin both in terms of legal infraction, that is breaking a law, but also in terms of personal betrayal. Now, I don't know about you, but that hurts even worse. It's one thing for your child to break your commandment. It's another thing for your child to literally disown you. to slander you. But as covenant breakers, that's how we treat God. And then thirdly, we should view God's redemptive work as a fulfillment of His original intentions for mankind, for humanity, 
Jesus perfectly keeps God's law. He dies on the tree of Calvary, which now becomes for us a tree of life. Jesus attained the wisdom that Adam was supposed to attain, which was symbolized by the tree of knowledge. And by putting our faith in Jesus, the second Adam, you and I now have access to the tree of life. All right, so that's creation and covenant. We come now to consider the fall and the curse. Again, we're trying to establish the thesis that the kingdom of God and that the special presence of God are the primary themes of the Old Testament. All right, and I want to kind of unfold chapter 3 here under the headings Cosmic Treason, which in essence is to try to be like God. And then part two of chapter three, the emperor strikes back the blessed curse, okay? So here's the thesis. If Genesis 1 and 2 provide a theological portrait of God as sovereign king inaugurating his kingdom, Genesis 3, commonly referred to as the fall narrative, provides a theological portrait of mankind, God's vassal son, following the serpent in cosmic treason against Yahweh Elohim and of God's judicial and redemptive response to man's rebellion. That's what Genesis 3 is all about. So the first part, we read this in Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he says to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the serpent responded, The woman responds to the serpent. She says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat from the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Moses signals a shift in the plot when in in chapter 3, verse 1, he introduces a new character in the narrative. The designation serpent may at first glance suggest nothing more than an ordinary snake. But additional information in the account suggests that the entity is something more than a mere snake. After all, it talks with humans. Um, The serpent entices humans to sin. And then the serpent and his offspring are cursed by God. And so the mixture of animal and what we might call supra-animal characteristics raises the question of the real identity of this tempter. Now, traditionally, scholars have viewed the serpent in Genesis 3 as an ordinary snake being used as a kind of a mouthpiece by Satan. And they'll point to the fact that the serpent seems to be compared to other animals, verse 1 of chapter 3, Sapient qualities are elsewhere in the Bible attributed to animals, including snakes. Satan and demons are able to interpossess and influence animals and humans. Remember in the New Testament, the demons go into a herd of swine. And then God's curse on the, on the snake uh, really in, extends, or his curse on the snake extends to the real culprit behind the snake just as Jesus' rebuke of Peter ultimately is aimed at Satan. So, in other words, you know, when God curses the animal, it's not like, and some people mischaracterize the Bible this way to say that, oh, you know, God pronounced a curse on on snakes, serpents, so that they have to crawl on their belly, and that's what Genesis 3 is all about. It's just a kind of, it's like a, you know, it's like a story that you tell children as to, you know, how did a duck get a bill, or how did a rhino get a, you know, horn on his snout or whatever. And how, do, how is it that snakes didn't get any legs? Well, here's a story I'm going to make up and interest my children in that. That's not the purpose of Genesis 3. So God is cursing the snake, but ultimately it's, it's pointed at Satan. Uh, some, however, like myself, have argued that the serpent is actually a title. Not so much a description, it's a title for this entity. Um, And it's actually 
a supernatural cherub-like creature known as a seraphim, which is a throne guardian. You see them in Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah the prophet sees Yahweh high and lifted up, and then he sees these seraphim creatures. They're winged beings, and they're surrounding the throne of Yahweh. They are his throne guardians. Now, what are some arguments to view the serpent this way? Well, we could interpret 3.1 as a contrast. In contrast with the other animals that were in the garden, this creature was wise. All right? Um, also, God's curse on the serpent results in his going forth on his belly, licking the dust, um, having the woman's offspring put his foot on his head. These don't have to be interpreted literally. These are metaphors that refer to defeat. And you see these being used elsewhere, as we're going to look at shortly. The serpent is also able to communicate, and he's not only wiser than the animals, but in some respects, he's wiser than the humans. Scripture elsewhere identifies the serpent of Genesis 3 with the devil and Satan. All right, so look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the, his, in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain, and he sees the what? The dragon. That ancient serpent, who's the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. All right? Uh, by the way, if, did you see the hobbit? Okay, and, and, and when I saw smog... Guess what I thought about? There you have a serpent that can talk, and that's shrewd. And I thought to myself, I wonder if that's what the serpent of the garden was like. In fact, I've written an article there, uh, Snake or Seraph, the Identity of, of the Serpent in Genesis 3. You can look that up at your leisure. Okay? Whatever, whether Satan is using an ordinary snake or whether he's appeared in person as a sort of a cosmic dragon, you might say, um, he shows up in the Holy Garden Sanctuary with an evil intention to lead Yahweh's newly appointed vice regent into cosmic mutiny and insurrection against the Creator. After the woman cites the death sanction that God had given to Adam, Namely, if they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they're going to die. The serpent counters with an attack on God's goodness. He says, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be just like him. You're going to have that kingly prerogative, knowing good and evil. And so they respond, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to do what? Make one what? Wise. Again, can you see how that idea of wisdom is tied up with the, the, the idea of knowledge of good and evil? She then took of its fruit and ate, and she gave also some to her husband who was what? He was right there all along, and he ate which underscores his complicity, all right? Because he's right there physically with her. Moreover, the serpent uses second-person personal pronoun throughout the narrative, indicating he's speaking to both of them. And, of course, God later on confirms this when God begins to question the man first. He is responsible, okay? So they, they, both, they both rebel. That raises the question, what's the nature of this first sin? Well, some... Some say it's unbelief. I think C.H. Spurgeon says that the first sin is epitomized in unbelief. Others say it's selfishness. I would agree with those who identify the root of the first human sin as pride. I mean, after all, Adam wants to be like God. William Dumbrell puts it this way, By eating of the fruit, man was intruding into an area reserved for God alone. And the violation of the command is tantamount to an assertion of equality, a snatching at deity. 
And I think one confirmation of this that we get from the New Testament is that it's the polar opposite of the response we see in the second Adam. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 8. Though Jesus was in the form of God, I mean, there's a sense in which Jesus was more than the first Adam, okay? Yet he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. He made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. That, in other words, this is the exact opposite response of the first Adam. <clears throat> the first Adam snatched after deity, after that divine prerogative. <coughs> Excuse me. So immediately after eating the fruit, Adam and Eve begin to experience the consequences of sin. We read that when the eyes of both of them were open, they knew that they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together, they made themselves loin cloths. So their nakedness had sort of symbolized their moral innocence, but now the homemade covering symbolized their feeble and futile attempts to cover their own guilt and their shame. Some practical applications. Human sinfulness is, is not a natural survival mechanism developed as a product of blind evolution. It's an abnormal ethical condition that can be traced to a primordial sin in the Garden of Eden. So the Christian's anthropology is going to you know, be dramatically, radically different at this point than the secular materialist anthropology. Secondly, success in overcoming temptation requires that we give our supreme allegiance to God and God alone. I mean, look, wouldn't that just settle the problem? Somebody says, I want to stop sinning. Okay, just give your supreme allegiance to God. Every thought you think, every move you make, every decision, every action, keep God first. That's it. You don't even need the Ten Commandments. Just do that. I know. Easier said than done, right? And then thirdly, behold the contrast between Adam's succumbing to temptation and Christ's victory over temptation. Some people say, well, it was the environment. If you only understood that the upbringing I had, the environment, uh, the setting I was in and so forth, all of those things sort of made it where it was almost impossible where I couldn't sin. Well, that sounds like the environment Jesus was in 40 days and 40 nights, in the wilderness without food and drink, with the wild animals, being tempted by the devil. Did he succumb? Nope. Bad environment, positive response. But what about Adam? Paradise! All the food you can eat, beautiful world. Here's a why. I mean, everything, okay, you could want, and he still sinned, all right? So we can't blame it on our environment. Moreover, if we're in a bad environment, we can still be like Jesus, trust in God and obey. Well, shortly after eating the fruit, making coverings, they hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hide themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim among the trees of the garden. So as I indicated in an earlier lecture, the cool of the day could refer to like late afternoon, dusk, before the sun sets. It may refer to a violent storm. In any case, what confronted Adam and Eve in the garden was what we would call a judgment theophany, and it scared them to death. So Yahweh summons Adam as covenant head. The Lord God calls to the man and says, where are you? Now, by the way, the word translated call is used elsewhere in the Bible to refer to a judicial su summons. 
Okay? It's like when you know, the court calls you to appear before the judge. The man's being summoned to appear in court before his holy suzerain. And this is another indication of the existence of a creation covenant which has just been breached. God follows his summons with two questions directed to Adam and one directed to Eve. To Adam, he says, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And then he says to Eve, What is this you have done? Now, it's important to understand God's purpose behind these questions. He's not just soliciting information. He's not like, you know, the detective that doesn't have a clue yet, but he's taking notes. Um, God already knows what's happened, all right? He doesn't need them to tell him, necessarily. Um, Rather, God is linking Adam's nakedness to his act of eating the forbidden fruit. Moreover, God is endeavoring to solicit from the man and the woman a confession of sin. And hence, his summons and interrogation carry a judicial and redemptive design. And so it is with you and me. God's revelation in Scripture exposes our sin. Why? Simply to make us feel guilty? No. In order to, one, solicit from us a confession so that we might experience, two, the grace of God's forgiveness. That's a redemptive design. Judicial, yes, but redemptive as well. Adam and Eve respond to God's interrogation with an explanation of the circumstances that gave rise to the crime and with a formal confession of wrongdoing. Now, most commentators interpret the explanatory clauses as attempts to blame shift, and as a result, they discount the the confession as genuine. Um, And I do agree with them that Adam and Eve are, to some degree, mitigating their guilt by blame shifting, but... I think there are reasons why we should interpret their confession of sin as genuine. Okay? So, first of all, each admit to violating the prohibition. They don't try to get out of it. Yes, we did it. I ate. Secondly, God accepts their explanations of the circumstances that lead up to their sin as being factually true, which is seen in God's turning to the other party. So, it wasn't when Adam said, my wife gave to me and I ate, it wasn't God, as if God said, no, you're lying. No, he accepted that. Yep, you're right. You're telling the truth. That's what really happened. Okay? And so he's turning to the other party. He's, he's, he's not rebuking them for blame shifting. So even though they might have been blame shifting, I, I think God is acknowledging the truth of their confession their explanation. He mitigates their punishment by letting them live and fulfilling the creation mandate, albeit under the curse. Fourthly, I think their confession was genuine because God inserts within the curse on the serpent a promise of redemption. Fifthly, Adam and Eve appear to respond to this first gospel in faith and hope. And then sixthly, God in turn responds to Adam and Eve's confession and faith, and this is important, with a token of special or saving grace, namely the covering of their nakedness, which symbolizes the covering of guilt. All right? So God says, no, those fig leaves you made, that's, it can't be the work of your own hands. But I myself will provide the covering. And by the way, what this teaches us, the fact that, that God accepted their imperfect confession. I mean, you and I could wish that Adam and Eve would have been more like, you know, throwing dust on their head and taking full blame. It wasn't the woman. It's all my fault, God. Um, and, the, and the woman said, it's not really the serpent's fault. It's all my fault, Lord. But the fact that God could still accept their confession, even though it might have been mixed with a little sin still, um, should be comforting to us. Because, you know, as we look back to our own conversion. The very first instances of repentance and faith, they weren't perfect. Still not perfect. Okay? Nevertheless, wherever there's a seed, however small, of genuine contrition and saving faith, God accepts it and God shows himself gracious. So let's go ahead and stop right there and uh, we'll come back at our next hour.